Sansa Stark, the Lady of Winterfell. Thank you for inviting us into your home, Lady Stark. Winterfell is yours, Your Grace. Hi everyone, it's Charlie. This is going to be my Game of Thrones Season 8 Episode 1 video. Congratulations, you all made it. Now everybody grab your Valyrian swords and hop a dragon. Let's go. I'll be doing videos all season long. If you're brand new to the channel, be sure to subscribe to get all the videos. I also do a weekly HBO Now giveaway. All you have to do to enter that is be a subscriber and leave a comment on the video. There was so much stuff in the episode to cover so many Easter eggs and references to earlier episodes, particularly the pilot episode, that I did this like a top 15 instead of my normal top 10. Careful for spoilers if you have not seen the episode yet. So starting with number 15, the brand new intro sequence, they got a major upgrade to not only the map table that it pans around, but also the astrolabe itself. You notice that the emblems aren't only just the house sigils, they also tell the story of A Song of Ice and Fire. They even reference the dragons in the comet from way back in season one, if you ever wondered whether or not they would reference the comet again. You also probably picked up on the fact that the intro sequence begins from the Night King's perspective because you start facing south, you crush through the wall, as the camera pans around you notice the deep blue tiles flipping over on the regular winter tiles just denoting their path as they come straight down to the last hearth. So the map table itself is telling you where the Night King is going, it's basically telling you the story of the show episode by episode like they came down to the last hearth first, then they're turning to Winterfell. The other important thing too is that when they take you through each of the bigger locations like Winterfell and King's Landing, you actually go inside the buildings. They particularly denote places like the crypts because that's where Jon Snow finds the truth about his parents. When you're in King's Landing, they also remind you about the scorpion that's pointing at Balerion the Black Dread skull underneath the throne room. Just because that's going to be a big threat to Daenerys' dragons this season because Cersei's still on the opposite side of this. I don't know how effective it'd be against Viserion since technically he's still dead. I suppose you could do enough damage to his wings with enough scorpion bolts that you could probably bring him down that way. 14, Jon Snow and Daenerys arrive at Winterfell. So if you can tell, this is a giant homage to the pilot episode when Robert Baratheon arrived. They even had the same soundtrack when they were marching in. The name of the song is The King Arrives. So they also do a mirror scene. You know, if you remember the pilot episode, you see Arya running through the crowd. She jumps up on top of that wagon to get a good vantage point. But this time it's another northerner little boy whose perspective you're getting as he sort of runs through the crowd. He rushes past Arya who smiles at him because she's taller now. They make a joke about her being taller later in the episode so she can see just fine. He climbs on top of a branch just like Bran climbed on top of the castle to get a better look. The progression of Arya smiles as people went by. She got really excited when Jon Snow went by. Like she wanted to call out to him, but she wasn't quite sure. So she let him pass. But then she saw the hound in Gendry smiled even bigger. She gave the biggest reaction when the dragons flew overhead though. Just that look of wonder blooming on her face. That was the one that they put in the teaser that we kept seeing earlier this year. The look on Sansa's face when the dragons fly overhead looks more like worry, but we all know about the Sansa Daenerys drama that's going to be happening the first couple of episodes, so it's just sort of laying the seeds for that. Like she's worried about Daenerys and what's going to happen with her being up there. 13, Jon Snow introduces Daenerys to the Stark family and the Northern Lords. So there was a couple awkward moments, couple funny moments, just like Robert Baratheon greeting all the Starks. So Jon just rushes to hug Bran because they haven't seen each other since season one. Sansa is happy to see him again, but then it gets really awkward once Daenerys walks up. That was the shot in the trailer that we kept seeing. Your grace, Winterfell is yours. And it's just all the shade in the world. But if you look in the background of these shots, even funnier is the little bear who's staring daggers next to Jan Royce. I feel like the way they played the brand reveal telling Daenerys about Viserion being an undead white at the command of the Night King was played as a little bit of a dark joke to just cut the tension. We don't have time for this. I need to tell you about all the terrible things that happened to your child. And they do it again later in the episode when Daenerys is talking to Samwell. A lot of really dark but funny moments at the same time. You feel kind of bad for laughing at them, particularly when Samwell is finding out about his family dying. But things only continue to get more awkward towards the end of the episode. They just want to set up the drama plot for the next couple of episodes. So number 12, Jon Snow versus the Little Bear and the rest of the Northern Lords. They don't waste any time in digging into him. So this is all about setting up the idea that they started last season where the Northern Lords got really pissed at Jon for leaving and now they're even more upset because he bent the knee and he's no longer technically King in the North. There was even the funny joke about Little Lord Umber not being sure what the power structure was because they had so many people at the front of the table. He said Milady to Sansa, then Malord to Jon Snow, then Your Grace to Daenerys. That was obviously just to remind you that he was a character on the show so that the reveal at the end of the episode when the Night King used him for finger paints was that much more shocking. 11 was the Tyrion and Sansa reunion. I felt so bad about Tyrion in this episode. They are really laying it on thick. 
I used to think that you were the cleverest man alive. This is sort of like the beginning of the end for Tyrion. Say your prayers. If you thought that he made bad decisions during season seven, all the times in the episode that he assured everyone, including the Northern Lords in front of everyone, that Cersei was definitely going to be sending them reinforcements is not going to bode well when Jaime arrives and tries to explain to them what's really going on. They have a couple more of those really dark, funny moments joking about Joffrey's wedding. Oh, it had its moments, like Sansa was really happy that he died. Well, you kind of bolted. Well, we both survived. Congratulations. I think a lot of this isn't so much about making Sansa seem smarter. I think it's more about making Tyrion seem like he's slowly falling from grace, just like making one bad call after another. That really ominous look that Bran gives him at the end of the episode does not bode well for Tyrion, so just say your prayers. But number 10, Jon Snow Arya reunion in the Godswood. You used to be taller, like making another joke about Arya being super tall and not needing to climb up on that wagon like she did during the pilot. They make a couple references to her being a faceless person. How did you sneak up on me? How did you survive a knife to the heart? Probably one of the funniest Jon Snow jokes that he's ever told. I didn't survive. So never let it be said that Jon Snow could never tell a joke. It's just his sense of humor is very Ned Stark. They have a nice embrace referencing a moment from season one, episode two, when he gave her needle. You used it a couple times. Another joke. Yeah, I used it a couple. Then several times after that, us remembering all the people that she's killed. The weird thing about the long claw moment, though, is that I don't know what kind of payoff they were trying to give because she has the dagger. She didn't tell him about it. Are you jealous that I have this giant Valyrian sword? It seems a little weird that she wouldn't have whipped the dagger out and shown him in that moment. All the talk about Arya taking Sansa's side in all these arguments is just paying off that arc from last season. The lone wolf dies, but the pack survives. That was what that Littlefinger plot was all about. So one, that lets you know that there's not going to be any kind of drama between Arya and Sansa this season, but it also leads into that quote where Jon says, just remind her that I'm her family too, and Arya says, don't you forget that either, because he's getting ready to find out who his parents truly are, so he's going to be conflicted about his family, but the Stark family will still treat him like family. Arya's just trying to remind him of that, so this is all set up for that big payoff at the end of the episode. Number nine, the Golden Company arrives at King's Landing. This is also one of those really dark and funny moments because Cersei's got this weird smile on her face like she's very smug. Kyburn runs up to tell her, your grace, it's terrible. The dead have breached the wall and all she can say is good, that's great, and walks back in to receive the Golden Company. They lay a little bit of groundwork in their conversation for a year on versus everyone else type of conflict where you find out that he probably killed a couple members of the Golden Company. He says, oh, you know, they weren't good warriors. You won't miss them. They were cheating at games, or maybe I was cheating. I don't remember. So it definitely sounds like he killed them and Harry Strickland isn't really happy about it, but he's putting up with it because Cersei is paying them so much money. So obviously I've already done a couple videos about the Golden Company, their background. I'm hoping for a couple really big moments from them this season, a couple big battles, but I don't know how big they're going to be and how much of their history they're going to get into. If there are any big Easter eggs and videos or scenes, then I'll let you guys know. But for now, they're just sort of laying a little bit of groundwork. Although they do have a joke about elephants. And I wonder if that was because the production, the producers didn't want to deal with the hassle of filming with elephants. So Cersei had a couple lines of dialogue that felt like they were very meta jokes from the writers, just talking to the fans. Like we really, really wanted to see some elephants, but we couldn't afford it. And it's too difficult to deal with when you're trying to film a big battle scene. So I don't know whether or not we're actually going to see elephants this season or if they'll pay that off later. But number eight, then you have the Cersei versus Euron subplot with him trying to bed her to make good on their agreement. Wars take a long time. Why don't we just get this over with right now? And there's this weird look on her face. Like you wonder what her thought process is. Like, is she just trying to keep him under her thumb? Is she worried that he's going to rebel against her? Because she definitely hates him. Do you want to keep your head attached to your body? And then after he leaves, it almost seems like she's going to throw up in her wine glass. So she definitely hates Euron and is trying to outmaneuver him. But number seven, welcome back Braun, who is now officially Team Cersei, although he does look conflicted about it. He really wants that castle. I think that's the justification from a character standpoint. Love it or hate it, I do love that funny conversation that he has with the girls in his bed. I'm one of the only people that's ever brought down a dragon. That's a big deal. Like he's trying to remind them about how he's an important person. The comedic timing of this scene with Kyburn is almost perfect though. I think that was more to pay off the WTF moment at the end when he found out exactly what Cersei wanted him to do. But as the young woman propositions Kyburn, you know, I'm very fond of old men. And he says, oh, poor girl, she's going to die of pox within the year. And Bronn almost chokes on his wine. Which girl are you talking about? Then Kyburn explains that should Jaime and Tyrion survive the war with the dead, Cersei wants Bronn to kill them, and Poetic Justice wants him to do it using the crossbow that Tyrion used to kill Tywin during Season 4. This is the same crossbow that he used against him. 
So I think this is just the beginning of a bunch of main characters making really good or really terrible choices and then that leading to their eventual demise. So if you notice characters making morally reprehensible decisions during episodes, it probably means they're headed for some big comeuppance. So something terrible might wind up happening to Braun. Six, Theon and his Ironborn rescue Yara off of Euron's boat. I love the way that she just headbutted him. That was for being so weak and not being able to rescue her and stand up to Euron back during season seven. Remember, he just stood there and pissed himself when Euron challenged him. Come over here, take her from me. Now he seems a little more sure of himself. Then he splits with her to go back to Winterfell to fight the army of the dead and be more honorable. She goes back to the Iron Islands to try and take them because they aren't being defended by Euron at the moment. Maybe Theon will make it there before the big episode three battle, but number five, Jon Snow finally rides Rhaegal for the first time. He rides a dragon, one of the biggest questions that fans have had ever since we learned that he was a secret Targaryen, even before that when people suspected it, but it hadn't been proven yet. The funny thing about this too is that Rhaegal even cuddles up to him like a puppy before they begin and they kind of play it for comedy with him flying all over the dragon but he seems like a natural and the place where they land is a huge callback to Egret in Jon Snow's cave. They even give Daenerys a couple lines of dialogue very similar to what Egret said to Jon Snow while they were still in the cave. Don't go, let's stay in this cave forever. Daenerys says we could stay in here for a thousand years and even funnier too was Drogon's reaction to their public display of affection. Like he's just being protective but Jon Snow just that look of terror on his face as Drogon gets really protective of her. Four was Gendry, Arya, and the Hounds reunion. Now obviously she has very different types of relationships with both of those people. Like the Hound was being a little more gruff with her. You seem like a cold bitch but I suppose that's why you're still alive. That's his way of telling her that he's happy to see her. I'm happy that you're still alive. The Gendry reunion also had a couple lines of dialogue referencing moments that they had together back during season three where she said you could be my family and he says no you would be my lady so he calls her my lady a couple times she finally smiles but they also lay the seeds for the special weapon quote unquote that he's going to be creating for her using her Valyrian dagger so it's just a really large spear you saw during the trailer when she's spinning it around in that huge battle so it's just going to be a really cool badass weapon and he gave the hound the big upgrade of the dragonglass axe. Three was Daenerys' conversation with Samwell that went off the rails so quickly in the most wonderful way possible. The whole reason she sought him out was to thank him for curing Ser Jorah's grayscale during season seven. She makes it sound like she's going to reinstate him as a student in the Citadel or even name him as a full-blown maester. Just something really wonderful. He's really excited and they start talking about Valyrian swords and that's how they get to her burning his family. Their timing during this was perfect, but you kind of feel bad for chuckling a little bit. So he says, well, my father's dead. That's awful, but at least my brother's still alive. I'll get to go home. And she's like, nope, can't do that. I burned your brother too. That's when he loses it. But look at Daenerys' reaction. She is stone cold as if she'd do it again in a heartbeat if she had to. The look on Sir George's face in the background while this is happening is priceless too. But this sort of leads Samuel to talk to Bran and the R plus L equals J. So number two, Samuel finally tells Jon the truth about R plus L equals J. You were never a bastard. So Jon is at Ned Stark's statue trying to make sense of everything and Sam confronts him about the death of his family and they try to play it as if they're questioning Daenerys' honor. Also too, when he tells him the truth about being the true heir to the Iron Throne. Daenerys didn't tell you the truth about what she did to my family. Isn't that interesting? Would Daenerys also set aside her claim to the throne the way that you set aside your crown to bend the knee and save your people by forming this alliance in the first place? It's all just drama that they're building towards in episode two in the eventual episode three big battle. The rest of the episode is really just a parade of horror-like reactions that different characters have to different situations. Jamie arriving at Winterfell, satisfied with himself, I'm doing the honorable thing, but then immediately noticing Bran and recognizing him. The look of horror and remorse on his face is priceless. But number one, we have to talk about that genuine horror moment with the Night's Watch at the last heart at the end of the episode. Turns out they didn't get those extra wagons and horses quite as quickly as they needed. So Tormund and Beric have made it down from the wall with a couple of the wildlings. They run into Ed and the Night's Watch who are also investigating the last hearth and they find little Lord Umber who's been turned into finger paints by the Night King who does not go quickly like they try to set him on fire and he just continues screaming and screaming. They just draw the scene right out. It's a really genuine classic horror moment from Game of Thrones. We don't get those very often but because this is the final season I'm expecting a little bit more of this. I did like the joke about Tormund always having blue eyes. Just another one of those weird comedic moments they worked into the episode. But let me know in the comments, what was your favorite moment or your biggest WTF? What'll happen is, is I will do a trailer video for episode two tomorrow and I'll name a giveaway winner during that. I'm also doing Q and A videos. That'll probably be on Tuesday. So leave all the questions in the comments that you want me to include in that or any just big things that you were confused about during the episode. 
While you wait for everything, click here for all my Game of Thrones Season 8 trailer and promo videos, and click here to learn a little bit more about what's going on with the Night King this season. Thank you so much for watching. Everybody stay awesome. I'll see you guys tonight.